This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. Thanks again to Rachel and Ryan last week for filling in for me while I was uh, on the, in Tahiti with my wife taking care of some family matters. And unfortunately, the trip wasn't long enough to improve my French, but it was long enough for me to get too much sun and eat too much good Polynesian food. So it's been 30 years since I was in French Polynesia, and things have certainly changed, but the natural beauty and the wonderful people are still amazing. So being in Tahiti showed, slowed me down a little bit, but it didn't stop me from thinking about hydrogen. And while meditating on the irony of how much sense hydrogen makes versus how little traction it's getting, even among the most hardcore tree huggers and climate change proponents, I think I've sorted out some of the core issues. Everyone is gravitating to batteries to store energy, even when the national lab studies all say that batteries are not economically feasible or sustainable in many of the applications they're being considered for now. All the major automakers are in production or moving to be in production and have made huge capital investments to be in production for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, but the gas and oil industries are not moving at all in the hydrogen direction. Why? In the Air Force, we used to say, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And I've concluded that that's the key to that I was searching for. The auto industry and engine manufacturers are trying to meet strict federal mandates to reduce particulate and greenhouse gas emissions, and they have, to con they have concluded that electric vehicles are the future. But there is no such issue on the fuel side. And the first fuel substitute, that meaning batteries, are struggling even to get their infrastructure in place to support their vehicles, even though Tesla and others are pushing hard. So in a sense, the car and truck makers are the only ones moving towards clean transportation, but the fuel companies aren't. The oil and natural gas industries see nothing broken, while the car makers know that they need to make some clean electric vehicles or they will not be able to sell cars at all in the not too distant future. So they have something that will soon be broken if they don't fix it. Elon Musk, the brain and brawn behind Tesla, is betting big on batteries, but the natural gas industry is investing in CNG and LNG, and the oil companies know that they'll be providing gas and diesel for vehicles for years to come. So nothing is broken with them. So today I offer you a challenge. How do we make the oil and gas industries see that they need to manage their future now? How do we show them that they are broken, even if they don't see it? Maybe if we take away all the government incentives, the tax breaks and other, other subsidies that they have, they would be broken and they would for sure be looking for clean solutions. But anyway, send me your suggestions. We'll see what we can do. My guest today is Skyping in from the soon to be frozen tundra of North America and he is one of the warriors familiar with the if it's not broken concept, don't fix it concept. And he gives advice to a lot of folks to keep them making good energy decisions. So welcome to Gary White, founder and CEO of Blackstart. For those of you that are not familiar with the term Blackstart, Blackstart is the electrical, when is the electrical utility is faced with a large portion of its grid dropping off of the line and the challenges it faces bringing that power back online. So welcome Gary White. Uh, recent retiree from the Air Force Reserves and uh, energy expert that was given advice to the Pentagon. Glad to have you on board, Gary. Glad you could join us today. Well, thanks, Stan. I appreciate that and uh, glad to be here. I wore this uh, Hawaiian shirt uh, on a Friday afternoon in D.C. for you. It makes me, uh, makes me feel warm just wearing it. I appreciate it. It's a lot of Friday <laughs> everywhere. So uh, give, us, give us an idea of how you got interested in doing energy things and what, what has driven your train in terms of, uh, you know, getting out, uh, out of the active duty, you know, you're, you weren't always on active duty, but the last assignment you had on active duty was very energy intensive. And uh, what kind of got you headed down that road and starting your own company uh, on, regarding energy? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, my story is uh, a little a little strange. It's not uh, the normal, but that's good, which has led to a lot of uh, innovative thinking and, and how I ended up coming up with uh, the Black Start innovation concept. Um, so, uh, as you know, I, I had active duty time, and then I switched into the reserves, and I had various assignments, but bottom line is I'm an acquisition guy by trade. Um, I started out as a flyer, crossed into this world of uh, purchasing 
everything from uh, satellite systems to uh, other complex uh, for military sales, command and control equipment for the Air Force. And um, my career kind of went on uh, as an acquirer and program manager. And then I had this unique opportunity to enter the energy world. And it was the first time since I left the flying world that I truly uh, found a passion uh, behind what I was doing. I felt that like it was not only giving back to the Air Force and doing a, a great service for our national security, but also for the nation at large from an economic perspective, from you know bettering uh, the, uh, the climate and um, uh, the environment. Uh, so there were a lot of pluses behind it, and it was quick and easy for me to get behind. Uh, and then uh, I was put into a very interesting position, as you mentioned, working with the Pentagon, uh, for the Pentagon, uh, as the number two guy focused on our installation uh, energy security, um, which kind of dovetailed into a previous assignment I had where I was a senior advisor to the uh, director of security for all of our installations across the DOD within uh, the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence Office. So they kind of dovetailed because, uh, you know, the reality is it's all about security of our installations from the military perspective, regardless of, of how, what that is, whether it's, you know, somebody who's physically attacking it or it's a threat to the energy that supplies uh, all of our missions the ability to, to function. Um, so, you know, it was kind of a, a good fit for me, even though I didn't have a traditional background in energy. I was, I was able to quickly step in uh, from that more operational national security perspective and, and easily take over uh, that mission. Uh, and so I did uh, almost two years there uh, doing that effort. We had a lot of creative projects that we were working on. One of the things I quickly realized was we had such a heavy uh, proportion of our work focused on large-scale generation at our installations. And so we're, we're talking about putting in large-scale uh, utility scales, so 10 megawatts or greater solar fields. We were looking at uh, wind turbines, of course, as a source of uh, distributed generation at the installations um, and other means. But we really weren't emphasizing a whole lot on other types of technology that, that could really supplement that generation. Um, a, a lot of the big uh, benefit to generation ended up, in my mind at least, uh, still focusing on cost savings you know, and, and efficiencies that way. And that's great, and that's a big piece of the puzzle, but there's still a lot of other pieces involved. And you know, so and when and I, I, would, I would attribute of, that, uh, that perspective, um, if I can interrupt there. Um, you know, you mentioned you came from an operational background, and I think that is really a key piece that most people, even inside the Air Force, don't understand. You know, a lot of folks in the Air Force kind of get stovepiped in acquisition or maintenance or some other field, but when you've been in the, even the maintenance world deploys, you know, when you've been in an operational unit um, for a good portion of your career, you have a different perspective. You're, you're not just into what makes a dollars and cents thing, but what's make, what makes the mission happen. And that's the kind of perspective I think uh, makes, makes it great for a guy like you to show up and, and take the career path you did because uh, like, like you, uh, I had an operational background, but then I went off into plans and, and policy and things like that. And having that operational background makes a huge difference when you're trying to help the Air Force see the future. So I think that's part of what makes your, uh, your super sauce work. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, if you really think about it, it's the perspective of you were the end user at one point, and everybody else is working to supply something to the end user. So you come in really with that perspective of what works in the field, what doesn't. And that's not just military. I think that could be applied to many other industries as well. It's really understanding what the end result truly needs to be from somebody who's utilized it. And yeah, certainly, I think that's unique. Um, and uh, you know, my two cents on that really is, I think almost everybody in a support position, uh, you know, not necessarily needs to be tip of the spear at some point, but you know, if there's some kind of additional duty you could do for a couple of years that uh, gives you that insight, I think that's truly invaluable. Absolutely. Great. So your company, now that you've uh, you've kind of separated from the uh, military world and you're you're off on your own, what kind of things are you up to? We're, we're up to everything. Um, so, yeah, so, so going back uh, to what I was kind of saying, you know, I noticed a lot of pieces were missing to this big, you know, energy security, energy resiliency, our installation puzzle. Um, and a large proportion of that uh, were, you know, technologies and projects that could potentially supplement the large scale generation stuff that we were really heavily focused on. And so when I separated uh, or retired uh, now, then I started my own company, Black Start Innovation, and we're an innovation and energy resiliency-focused consultancy firm. Now, what does that mean? 
Uh, you know, we have sort of three levels of effort right now that we're, we're focused on, and it's, it's quite exciting stuff. Uh, one is you have a lot of uh, interesting entities right now within the Air Force and the Department of Defense at large that are focused on innovation, right, and, and which is really just coming up with new ideas. But, uh, you know, these different organizations and, and um, in, internal incubator programs that are being stood up and things like that are really focused largely on educational-related programs, so, which, which is great, you know, understanding how Silicon Valley works, how things are rapidly acquired and deployed and, and things of that nature. Um, that's fantastic, and that's good from a human capital perspective and, and maybe slowly changing the acquisition system. But ultimately, they're really not focused on solutions, uh, in my mind. So, you know, a lot of these programs also, in addition to the education, they focus on problems. And that's great. You can you can work for months and years even, and you can fine tune a problem. But if you're not also working or spending that same amount of effort on the problem as you are in identifying which solution areas will work in a given climate or a given region or whatever, based on different factors like economics, politics, what have you, then it's almost all for naught. Right? And an example of that is when we were with uh, the Office of Energy Assurance, we would often chase these large-scale uh, generation projects. And we would say, you know, we'd like to have a microgrid tied into that deal somehow, uh, which is the ability to island off from the main grid, to have your own generation capability right at the source, basically. And so uh, the, the companies that we were relying on to do this work, because we were trying to do things third-party finance, uh, would come back and say, well, you know, it's just not ripe in the market, basically, right? That's not going to pencil out on paper. And then, you know, throwing my operational hat on, you know, my mission, my mission hat that I wore at the beginning of the Air Force time, you know, I'm saying, well, that doesn't make any sense. How can I turn to that, that mission owner now and say, sorry, that doesn't work in the market right now. I'll get back to you in a couple of years. That didn't sit well with me, right? Didn't so sit well with the general either. Focusing on again within Black Star Innovation it, it is that problem alone. So it's taking these identified problems, acting as sort of, I use the, the uh, metaphor of like a talent scout for a baseball team. So going out there, searching the non-traditional players that the Department of Defense typically isn't looking at, and then saying, okay, you have a really interesting technology, and bringing that back into our partners within defense and saying, look what we found for you. There's something that could answer the problem here, and let's figure out a way, which we have, to go forward and acquire this. So that's one service area. So sort of acting like a talent scout for the DOD in the middle. And the other half of that, really, um, you know, not looking at it from a defense perspective, is uh, towards industry. There are a lot of companies, big and small, but particularly small, that one, don't understand the problems of the Defense Department or what they're looking for, and they don't understand that there are opportunities to get uh, unique, unique type of funding into their companies quickly. Um, and there are uh, a lot of companies out there that would love to do business uh, with defense, who have uh, relied strictly on, on venture capital as, an, as one example of funding. Now, the problem with like venture capital to them is they're under extreme pressure to get things done quickly. Right. And so that brings the level of quality of their product down. The Defense Department typically does not provide or uh, does not apply that kind of pressure uh, be, based on their money because they're not requiring a return. They don't take a piece of equity in it, you know, and that sort of stuff. So it's really a unique opportunity uh, for companies to come in serve their country in reality by solving a national security problem or helping to solve one, and then uh, leveraging unique funding. So we're going out there and we're educating these companies as well. We're serving as sort of consultants to them to help them not only understand the opportunities that are out there, help them commercialize their products uh, towards the Defense Department and, and the federal government at large, and then also um, working with them uh, on how they market that. So a lot of these firms are, are very engineer heavy, uh, even sometimes, I have a current client right now, uh, Prime Solutions Group, and they're fantastic. And they have hired us to help them uh, market and commercialize their product into the Department of Defense. They have a product where they go through a big data, uh, Internet of Things approach uh, to gather basically sen sensor data from every piece of energy equipment that you would have in an area, region, and installation, and then visualize that data into a nice management dashboard that someone can make a decision off of from a management level. Great. And that, yeah. that's that's something that's just an example of something that we're working to bring to defense. Yeah. And I find that's really common in what we do here in, in our office. 
is bring the military perspective not only to the um, to the uh, potential user Afro, but also to the con contractors and uh, even the state of Hawaii, and show them where the technology applies in their particular application. An example would be uh, when I first worked with U.S. Hybrid, I asked them what their appeal was to their their equipment to the Air Force, and and the the CEO said, "Oh, well, our equipment's clean and green," and I said, "The Air Force doesn't care if it's clean and green. It'll help them check a box off." for the EPA or something, but um, it's also expensive, so how do I sell the Air Force your equipment when it's expensive and all it's doing is checking off of a box, you know, for an, an issue that the Air Force has? And the answer I told them was, your equipment is silent. That's important to the military. Your equipment has no heat signature. That's important to the military. Your equipment's scalable and can deploy. That's important to the military. Your equipment doesn't put off any kind of uh, noxious fumes and you can operate it inside an enclosed space. That's important to the military. Your equipment, the exhaust kicks out water. That's important to the military. And those kind of things are really critical, and so I, I think you're in a, in a great market. You know, right now we're gonna take a quick break, and uh, we'll be right back with Gary, and he's gonna tell us some of his, about some of his projects he's got going on around the world. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran. Seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha! Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose the DT. Captain of our team. It's the DT. For every game day, assign a designated driver. And when I was in the Air Force, I was always a designated driver because I was always going to be the one to get in trouble. So I figured I better might as well just drive. <laughs> anyway, we're back with uh, Gary White from Black Start. And um, he was talking a little bit about making that connection between the technology and the user more so than just the economic equation that so many people are focused on today to make decisions. And I know that when Gary was working uh, with the Air Force, one of the things he started was the, what they call the JEDI program. So Gary, why don't you tell us a little bit how it started there and, and how you've kind of pulled that into what you're doing now. Right, so yeah, the JEDI lab was uh, pretty exciting and it's something that's still ongoing. Um, and what JEDI stands for is the Joint Energy Development Demonstration and Innovation Lab. Uh, some folks told me, hey, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, already has a JEDI uh, software application. I said, no problem. I added a D in lowercase di, so I think we're, I think we're good there. Um, but anyway, no, uh, Jedi, Jedi, was, uh, Jedi is basically a governance mechanism. One of the things I, I first saw was nobody's, nobody's talking uh, across departments. Nobody's talking across services. Uh, and a lot of us have the same energy problems. So... You know, as you can imagine, as director of innovation, I was going around and talking with everybody I could I could possibly talk to, figuring out what they're working on, what new technologies, and so forth. And I often found that we had the same problems. That uh, you know, a lot of times we were even looking at the same technologies, and we were doubling up on our spending on those. And I thought, well, that's kind of pointless. We should all get together in a room and, and talk. So, really, nothing cosmic that I came up with. In reality, it's just sort of uh, the basic basics of you know hey guys let's get together and, and get on the same page here and maybe we can join forces and and leverage uh, money across funding streams so uh jedi was stood up and, and one of the um the thoughts was let's take an ecosystem approach with this um now what does that mean that means that um uh, i want you to imagine like a silicon valley or imagine uh you know route 128 up in boston cambridge area um now take those and apply those out to wherever we want right uh maybe a rural area that doesn't have a lot of the resources that those areas already have. How would we build one? You 
know, how would we develop our own regional hubs, regional ecosystems to um, address the problems that we have on our installation? And so that was ongoing, and I came up with some interesting designs there, and that's something that we're focused on now as well at Black Start Innovation. That's sort of one of our central offerings is ecosystem design around energy innovation. So, you know, we've uh, designed a concept in Alaska, and we're engaging with some folks uh, to try and build that out right now. Um, and we've come with a unique approach where you would source problems initially within the department, but then also out in the community. As you can imagine, there are a lot of emergency management services that, that have similar uh, you know, uh, problems and, and similar opportunities that they see as well to separate off from the grid and have a distributed generation asset uh, and uh, microgrid setup. Um, but, but not just emergency management. You think about you know, small communities that don't have a backup. Some communities aren't even on the grid at all. And they already have you know, a basic quote unquote microgrid, but they could use uh, something more advanced. And so my, my process starts out with you know, dual sourcing the problems and then down selecting those to ones that make sense in the market, as I, as I mentioned before, pairing against that, and then running that through the local chamber of commerce, the Economic Development Council, leveraging startup uh, incubator and accelerator programs that I'm not only might already have te small technology companies that we can rapidly acquire uh, prototypes from, but also uh, programs that are willing to reach out to the wider community and say, hey, are you interested in solving a problem that your community has? Maybe you have technologists out there that have, or, or other folks interdisciplinary that have unique skill sets that they can come in, bring to the table, whether they form their own company or join another company that's already established, they can help solve the problem by bringing resources in locally. Part of what that does as well is it reduces logistical burden, right? And so uh, you're also leveraging uh, the power of the Economic Development Council's uh, funding outreach. So there are a lot of folks within different communities that, uh, in terms of venture capitalists, angel investors, those kinds of folks, but then also tr uh, interesting banking scenarios, so green banks, uh, things of that nature. And then uh, they also have the, uh, you have the ability to uh, reach out to different types of defense funding at that point. So that w when you get to that point, that might attract other folks with money or maybe folks within the Department of Energy to bring some of their resources. As an example, the National Renewable Energy Lab has an innovation program where if you come to them with a problem, whether it's another federal entity and a paired with a local community or a, a company, they'll chip in up to $175,000 of their money and resources in terms of people and experts and maybe even some lab space for you to work through. Then you take that all the way through this cycle, you start to create a prototype, you get it out into the field and test it, but then you've got a unique scenario here. You could potentially take resources on a military installation, and of course I'm always gonna come back to military because that's my focus, that's my background, you could take these resources in terms of, of personnel that either A, want to contribute something to the local community, or B, they have to meet a training requirement. And you could use these folks to take that prototype into the local field, do a train the trainer type scenario so that you can have an application applied towards the base and out into the community. And then once you test that a few times, you iterate on it, you can actually get something that grows a little bit. It'll attract more capital. It can be commercialized both ways. And then you have a solution that now can be procured in a traditional means at a large scale within the department, but now out uh, in society. And you've reduced the cost because you've obviously leveraged you know, training resources and things of that nature. So that's a basic scenario, but that's something that uh, we're, we're heavily working on and getting folks to try and adopt and get involved in in their local community. That's a great model. And I think the uh, application of the term ecosystem uh, with this problem set is, is important because what we're finding is so many times the things that are problems out in the community or in the military, um, they're identified in silos. But when you start solving them with the process you just described, they start seeing that there's a solution for this energy situation that also solves other problems or there's a logistics piece that can be um, made more efficient if you apply the energy piece to it. And when you start making those connections, you've got a, a much broader area of, uh, of support from the customer. And then like you say, when you start spreading the uh, economics out to the civilian world, now you have the economies of scale that, uh, that the industry can generate to get you a lower price for that equipment that you're gonna be purchasing. So 
I think your model is spot on. So are there any specifics you can talk about with any of your projects you got going on right now that um, can use for a good example? Uh, you know, I'd rather not get into individual project specifics, but we can talk about certain areas that uh, we're working with. Uh, okay. So two particular applications. One, I just want to mention, you know, something that you could do in a rural area, again, like Alaska, that's something you could, from a defense perspective, that's something you could replicate or at least test out and model there that you could take out into the field. So when you work, you know, in a remote area, whether it's in the desert or it's in somewhere in the Pacific, let's say, uh, and you're in a, a wartime scenario, you know, you have to work with the locals. You, you know, I, I did that in Iraq. I was in northern Iraq, and I had to work with the local Iraqis, the Kurds, uh, to do some airfield construction projects. I, I didn't think I'd be that involved with them, I thought maybe just a little bit on the side, but they were the ones really running the project. And so you have to learn their system and, and how that works, and you have to, to leverage their skill sets, which are different, unique, but you know, uh, also valuable, of course. And, uh, they're just unique scenarios. You really have to work in this sort of robust environment that sort of breeds innovation, you know, and, and uh, I think it's, so that's a benefit you could replicate it out. Now to talk another uh, somewhat specific Buffalo, let's talk about Buffalo, New York, right? Do you have, uh, for example, a, a reserve base there, Niagara Reserve Base? Uh, you also have a community in the Rust Belt that is uh, struggling to reinvent itself. Um, it, you know, the economy has taken a downturn in that region. Um, and folks uh, traditionally who are uh, working in mines and, and, and uh, brown energy uh, field, they're trying to find new ways uh, to, to um, contribute, uh, particularly energy, because they've been in that world for, for quite a while, just from a different perspective. This serves as a real opportunity now from an ecosystem approach to take uh, an area that has uh, perhaps brown fields that can pass environmental standards, you can convert those over. Uh, you can uh, use them to produce cleaner energy, uh, and then you can train people from an economic development perspective to come in and uh, you know have have a new career basically, um, and you can turn the economy around. New York is is really great uh, uh, as an example because of course they have uh, they're more advanced in their policy, um, like some other states like Hawaii and, and California, for example, that uh, they're really trying to push for a larger balance of renewables, in fact, a 50-50 split here uh, coming up. So we are working with partners uh, in the utility industry and folks uh, within the local government in Buffalo and the base to try and figure out a way forward for um, an economic or a, um, an innovation ecosystem approach to solving the energy needs at the installation and then also solving the needs out in the community from an economic perspective. Um, I think that's a really good example of how this approach could be applied across the board. So it's not this energy, it's not just national security, it's also uh, more of a localized economic um, approach. Great, well, we're gonna pass your name on to our state energy office, so, Please so do. maybe you can help them, help them with their perspective on things. Um, but believe it or not, Gary, we've, we've bumped up against our final minute in our uh, show today, and I wanna thank you for bringing your perspective to uh, energy planning and um, the, what your, your organization does to help make things happen, not just in the DOD, but in the civilian sector. So thanks for being on with us today. Thanks for wearing your Aloha shirt in uh, commemoration of uh, our great state here. And uh, we look forward to working with you and maybe you can get out here sometime and uh, be on the show live. I hope so. Thank you, Stan, I, it's been fun, appreciate uh, it. Okay, talk to you later, thanks. Take care. And uh, that's gonna wrap it up for Stan the Energy Man this Friday and uh, thanks for being here on my lunch hour and we'll see you next Friday, Aloha.